Yes, thank you very much. So today I will present our group's work on developing a catheter-based microfluidic device that produces large diameter microbubbles for sonothrombolysis applications. And so the clinical motivation here is to develop an interventional therapy for uh, treating thromboembolisms. And so uh, across the many diseases that are caused by thromboembolism, stroke, pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis, in the United States, several hundred thousand people are afflicted by these diseases. They're a major cause of death and disability. And this is in part due to uh, inefficacies in the treatment uh, paradigms for these diseases. Uh, so primarily for stroke, the primary treatment is intravenous tissue plasminogen activator uh, administration and then a course of anticoagulation therapy for venous thromboembolisms. And so to uh, improve upon the current treatment paradigms, the field has turned, to, turned towards catheter-based interventions for both stroke and deep vein thrombosis. And so uh, in both of these cases, there have been several clinical trials against stroke and DVT. And generally, there's a, a small improvement in patient outcomes. But overall, there's still significant uh, disability and death in these patient populations. And so what I'd like to introduce you to is, is another approach. And this is sonothrombolysis. And so many of you are probably familiar with sonothrombolysis. But it is defined as a combination of tissue plasminogen activator, ultrasound energy, and gas-filled microbubbles. And together, uh, these three agents uh, accelerate clot dissolution. And so one of the mechanisms is uh, that microbubbles can tunnel into the clots, uh, mechanically disrupting the fibrin mesh, and thereby uh, perhaps exposing more of the clot surface area for TPA activity. And so I have a nice video here um, demonstrating what a single bubble does when it's up against the face of the clot and uh, is exposed to ultrasound. And I did not collect this data. This is from um, Chris Aconcia, but let me play this video. So you can see the microbubble. Uh, when ultrasound is applied, the radiation force pushes the microbubble into the fiber network. Uh, at, with successive ultrasound waves, the microbubble impinges deeper into the fiber network uh, and then causes tunneling uh, and then eventually actually shoots out of the scene. And so sonothrombolysis has been evaluated in humans in a few different clinical trials. And generally, this technique re has resulted in approximately a two-fold uh, increase in clot lysis relative to TPA-only therapies. But all of these trials also indicated a small increased risk of off-target hemorrhage. And so if this technique is ever going to make it to the clinic, we either need to significantly increase clot lysis rates uh, or uh, decrease the risk of off-target hemorrhage. Uh, but preferably actually do both. And so this leads me into uh, the, the topic of our talk is catheter-directed sonothrombolysis. And so uh, what we seek to do here is leverage the benefits of the catheter-based therapies, primarily a, a highly localized therapeutic intervention, uh, with the benefits of sonothrombolysis, which is accelerated uh, clot lysis. And so our concept here is that we can insert a catheter directly into the occluded blood vessel uh, introduce microbubbles and or tissue plasminogen activator, and then also apply ultrasound either from the catheter itself or perhaps uh, transcutaneously. And so there were uh, four key aims in this project, the first of which is to develop a catheter. The second was to characterize the properties of the microbubbles that we're using. Uh, the third was to evaluate the in vitro sonothrombolysis efficacy in an in vitro model. And then finally, uh, we used a rat stroke model to evaluate the in vivo efficacy of this sonothrombolysis treatment. And so I'll go into AIM-1 first. So the catheter that we've designed, we've uh, elected to place a microfluidic device on the tip of the catheter. Uh, we have a flow-focusing microfluidic device in which two liquid channels pinch a gas channel to produce microbubbles. And you can see a video of this process here. This is attractive because by changing the liquid pressure or the gas pressure, we can change the microbubble diameter, the production rate, and we can also change the composition by changing which, which, ga which gases we're using or even the liquid phase as well. And so we use standard soft photolithography fabrication techniques to fabricate this catheter. I won't go into that in any more detail. Um, but this is the microfluidic channel network that we've uh, used in this project. So we have a gas inlet shown here. We have a liquid inlet shown here. And the two phases meet at a nozzle where the microbubbles are produced. And then there's an outlet so that the microbubbles can be released from the device. Uh, figure C here is a uh, camera photo of the 
catheter, and I have it placed next to a volcano ibis. So you can see that we can make it quite small. So this is you know, proof of concept demonstration that we can make it to human uh, size dimensions. And here's some high-speed camera images of the device actually operating. And so again, uh, we can make it small, and we can make it produce microbubbles uh, to the specifications required for this application. And so then aim two was to uh, characterize the microbubble properties. And so if you consider the microbubbles that have been used uh, in the past for sonothrombolysis applications, they're microbubbles like Definity or Sonaview, which are primarily designed to serve as ultrasound imaging contrast agents. And so these are small uh, microbubbles, one to five micron in diameter. They have low solubility gases so that they have a long circulation lifetime. But actually these microbubbles uh, may not be optimized for therapy. And so what we're seeking to achieve by placing a microfluidic catheter, or mi a microfluidic device on the catheter is to actually tailor the microbubble design for therapy. And so there's quite a large body of work that shows that larger microbubbles elicit stronger bioeffects uh, when exposed to ultrasound. So improved sonoperation, uh, improved sonothrombolysis, improved blood-brain barrier opening, for instance. Um, and then also because we're using a microfluidic device, we can select our gas. And because we can select the gas in the bubble, that means we can tune the lifetime of the bubble. So if we have a high solubility gas like carbon dioxide, we can produce a bubble that lasts a very short amount of time or we can use the standard perfluorocarbons uh, and produce a bubble that lasts a much longer time. And so the general concept here is we can produce a large microbubble directly in the blood vessel that is occluded. This is, this is a large bubble while it's therapeutically active, so it will produce larger bioeffects, and then we can rely on gas diffusion so that the bubble can shrink to mitigate the risk of gas emboli formation downstream, for instance. So those are uh, the microbubbles that we're using. Uh, AIM-3, uh, we use these microbubbles in a fairly standard in vitro sonothrombolysis assay where we have a blood clot uh, and a water bath. We expose it to ultrasound. The blood clot is in a tube with circulating human plasma, uh, microbubbles, and uh, tissue plasma engine activator. As the clot is eroded, uh, red blood cells leave the clot and go into the circulating plasma, and uh, we sample the plasma every three minutes, and we can actually quantify the rate of clot loss by measuring the hemoglobin concentration uh, in the red blood cells that are uh, taken away from the clot. And so this is a relatively high throughput assay for screening of the relevant parameters in this model. So TPA dose, uh, the ultrasound parameters, and, and the microbubble parameters. And so uh, here's some of the results of the uh, in vitro assay. So this is essentially I will discuss the effects of the microbubble size on clot lysis. So I have three bars here. Uh, bar A is the amount of clot loss with just standard TPA infusion, a standard clinical dose of TPA. And this is clot loss at 30 minutes, so after 30 minutes of, of therapy, let's say. Um, this is the clinical TPA dose, uh, clinically relevant ultrasound parameters, and then microbubbles that are like Definity. So it's about a two-fold increase over TPA alone. And then our large uh, microfluidic microbubbles with a diameter between 15 and 20 micrometers uh, is shown in C. And so the key finding here is that, you know, th these larger microbubbles provide about an eight-fold enhancement in uh, clot loss over TPA alone. So that's comparing bar C and bar A. And then about a four-and-a-half-fold enhancement over uh, standard sonothrombolysis. And then also, we investigated uh, reducing the TPA dose in this system because this is clinically important uh, because several patients are contraindicated uh, for TPA therapy. And so in those patients, uh, today, uh, almost virtually no intervention is performed. So if we can reduce the TPA dose, uh, then it can have a significant impact in the clinic. And so bars A and B are the same on the previous slide, but now C, D, and E are uh, are microfluidic microbubbles at different TPA doses. So this is the 1x dose. This is essentially the equivalent to a clinical dose of TPA. This is one-tenth of that clinical dose. And then this is uh, no TPA in the system at all. And so you can see that even with no TPA, we're still getting significant thrombolysis. And this is, we think, because of the increased bioeffects and cavitation of these larger microbubbles um, on the clot surface. So this is essentially purely mechanical disruption of the clot. 
And then AIM-4, uh, we tested this system using our microfluidically produced microbubbles in a rat stroke model. Um, and so here's a picture of a rat. We catheterize the carotid artery and then administer the clot directly into the brain from the carotid artery. And we let the clot sit there for 15 minutes to uh, establish a fixed position. And then over the next 30 minutes, we administer TPA and or microbubbles via the same carotid artery that the clot was introduced through. And in this uh, experiment, we are doing this for 30 minutes of therapy. And then the uh, carotid artery is closed uh, and, the, and the surgical site is closed. And then we let the lats live for an additional 24 hours and we're screening for brain infarction at this 24 hour time point to see what part of the brain has died. And so in this experiment, we have four experimental groups. Uh, group A received no intervention. So they received the clot, but no TPA, no ultrasound, no microbubbles. Group B received the clot uh, with a low dose of TPA. Group C received the clot and with a high dose of TPA. And then group D is our treatment group with a low dose of TPA and our microbubbles and ultrasound therapy. And so one of the primary readouts of this assay is brain infarction. So uh, this is from a control animal that received no intervention. You can clearly see that one side of the brain is pink. This is healthy living tissue at 24 hours. And the other side of the brain is white. So this part of the brain in this animal has died uh, as a result of the clot occluding uh, the vasculature. And so for the results, Again, we're screening for infarct volume percentage. So group A was the control group, no intervention, and there's somewhere between 30 and 40% infarct in the brain. Uh, group B is the low-dose TPA. So you can see that a low dose of TPA does not significantly reduce the infarct volume. Uh, group C is the high dose of TPA, so it, it recovers, uh, it reduces the infarct volume significantly. And then group D is our uh, sonothrombolysis treatment. And you can see group D is somewhere in between group B and C. So we're achieving uh, results in between a low dose and a high dose of TPA, but using a low dose of TPA with our sonothrombolysis therapy. And so what this means is that the sonothrombolysis therapy permits between a three and a half to eight fold TPA dose reduction. Now this is a wide range because you can see our error is, uh, standard error is quite large. It's a 95% confidence interval. But at least in this animal model, we, we can demonstrate that using sonothrombolysis permits a, a, a TPA dose reduction. And so then just to summarize, as part of this project, we developed a human dimension catheter. We're using a relatively novel therapeutic microbubble design. And we show both in vitro and in vivo uh, that this technique improves sonothrombolysis rates. And so I'd just like to thank the members of my lab and our funding sources. And thank you for your attention. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.